So about 60 years ago, young woman was returning home after what had been a disastrous honeymoon. And when her new husband went to work the next morning, she found herself alone, truly alone, for the first time in her life in their new apartment. And the first thing she did was call two people. She called Christo, this young artist that she would eventually marry and make art with for her entire life, and a locksmith. When her husband returned home that night to discover that his key no longer worked for the door to his apartment, he was furious. And he was pounding on the door, screaming about what was going on. Christo was hiding in the corner, and Jean-Claude, the young woman, stated firmly and resolutely through the door, your key does not fit my lock. And I love that story. <coughs> I like it because you know, it's romantic, it's a little bit exciting, it's kind of funny. But what makes it really interesting and why I love it is the context of that lock to every person in the story. For the husband who was there to exert control over that lock with his key and thereby control over Jean-Claude, he was completely confounded. And locks have everything to do with control. For Jean-Claude, who simply changed the lock, it was a tiny act of dissidence, but locks have everything to do with dissidence. And for Christo, for the guy hiding in the apartment of the husband of the woman that he would go on to be with his entire life, well, when she told her husband that his key didn't fit her lock, she was telling Christo that his key did. She had given him the key, that most sacred and perfect of totems to indicate love. And locks have everything to do with bringing us together and love as well. Now, I know that all of that seems a little ephemeral for a security conference, but let me tell you how I got down this train of thought to begin with. So a couple of years ago, I realized that I could either spend my time keeping up with everything new that was going to happen in physical security. I could start learning the EE stuff that I didn't have the background in. I could continue to keep up. Or I could go and look back at everything that came before. And then one of the locks in my collection made that decision for me. That says town, Yale and town. Now that's town as in Henry Robinson town, but also town as in Schuyler town. Uh, it's more town as in Henry Robinson town, who was partners with Linus Yale Jr., who's more commonly thought of as the father of the modern pin tumbler lock. Only as it turns out it was actually his father that created the modern pin tumbler lock. But it doesn't really matter because the first pin tumbler lock was patented 40 years before he got around to doing it. Uh, and none of that matters because most people think that the pin tumbler lock was invented by some Egyptian guy 4,000 years ago. So. <laughs> Fun fact about the pin tumbler lock. A lot of people think of cruciform locks. Those are the ones with pins coming in from multiple angles. They think of those as slightly more security and a natural evolution. But in reality, it was actually patented well before the inline tumbl pin tumbler lock. Um, but uh, that's neither here nor there, nothing to do with the talk. So Linus Yale Jr. was in a partnership with an old family member of mine, Henry Robinson Town. I thought that, that was absolutely fascinating, and it got me to look deeper and deeper into the history of physical security and learn more about these guys as well. Um, but in context for what I want to talk about today, these guys, Yale and Town, come a lot later. So, <clears throat> let's talk about the Egyptians. Now, this is the ancient Egyptian pin lock. Uh, it is incredibly similar to the pin lock that we have today. Now, as I said, most people think that this was created 4,000 years ago by some Egyptian guy. And the reason that we think that is because of a man named Vivant Denon. So Vivant Denon was an amateur archaeologist. He was an excellent uh, artist. Um, learned guy, wrote a lot, uh, you know, tend to salons in Paris and so on and so forth. Uh, he was also a very popular pornographer with a lot of weird porn. Um, but anyway, more importantly to our story, he traveled with Napoleon in Egypt. Now, if you guys forgot that Egypt invaded, or that Napoleon invaded Egypt, um, the, you probably remember that the Rosetta Stone was discovered in Egypt by the French. And this was part of this invasion. 
As a matter of fact, they found all sorts of artifacts. They found tons of them. So you might be wondering, why is the Rosetta Stone and a good number of these other artifacts, why are those in the British Museum and not somewhere in France? Well, it's because the invasion went really poorly. Um, and so as Napoleon was trying to get the heck out of Dodge, as he was trying to sail back to France with his people, the British basically blockaded him and said, give us all your stuff. And eventually they did. Um, so <clears throat> it was interesting because it wasn't just an invasion to conquer land. It was a, a cultural looting on an enormous scale. Um, what they brought back and what the British then seized and you know, didn't return to the Egyptians were incredible cultural artifacts spanning thousands of years. And Vivant Denon was at the forefront of discovery in this. Particularly interesting about Vivant Denon was that while he was part of Napoleon's Corps of Savants, this 170 person uh, artist, scientist, etc., that marched with the army to discover and catalog and loot uh, cultural artifacts from all around the Egypt, Vivant ended up going off to Upper Egypt. There we go. Uh, ended up going off to Upper Egypt after a guy named Murad Bey. Murad Bey was a guerrilla fighter. He was a cavalryman um, fighting for Egypt against Napoleon. So when uh, General Belliard and some other people had to go chase off after Murad Bey up into Upper Egypt, Denon said, let me go with them. Let me separate from the main army, the only one of the Corps of Savant to go into Upper Egypt because there had been trade with Egypt. People had been in Lower Egypt. While they were culturally looting and going to places they hadn't been before, those paths had been traveled before, but no educated European had really spent time in Upper Egypt at this point. So Denon was given leave to, to chase after Murad Bey with the small contingent of the army. And traveling through uh, Upper Egypt was a fascinating journey for him because he was now even more at the whim of a small contingent of the army chasing after a band of mounted guerrilla fighters. What this means is that he spent a lot of time just sitting in the middle of a desert looking at nothing. You know, and, and, and even more time bypassing amazing ruins, but he had to travel with the army. So he's you know, like, ah, mummies, I want to go, uh, we can't, we got to keep going. So it was you know, a terrible way to observe the world. But at one point in Upper Egypt, they're coming up on Karnak, this enormous series of ruins with Hypostyle Hall and uh, uh, Polis of Mat and all sorts of other uh, now well-known relics from the Egyptian age. And when we arrived, Denon was able to make some observations. <coughs> from his memoirs, I saw also delineated the gate of a temple with two folding doors shut by exactly the same kind of wooden locks that are at present made use of. He was talking about the locks that he was seeing all around him in Egypt. So there in a bar relief on the wall of the ruins, he saw a lock that he was seeing all around him throughout Egypt. And that had been recorded in Turkey even earlier than that. And he was amazed by this. He was absolutely amazed by this. And then was given to flights of fantastic language and, and vitriol and poetry. This is what he said about the pyramids. It is hard to decide what is more astonishing, the tyrannical dementia that dared order their building or the stupid obedience of the people who agreed to help build such things. That's what he thought of the pyramids, you know? He, he had amazing faculties for language and really wanted to instill in people the journey that he was taking, the observations that he was making, and the sense of wonder that he had for a lot of what he was seeing. In his enthusiastic but perhaps inaccurate observations about the lock, he went on to say, and finally, one of the amazing things about this. And finally, that a simple utilitarian invention has been transmitted by tradition through all the revolutions of nations. I think that's a really beautiful thought. And I think that it is an even more beautiful thought when you think about the fact that the locks on most of your doors is probably also based on that. And based directly on that. It was rediscovered by him coming back to America and people beginning to work on the pin tumbler lock again. This has been around forever and it's still on your door. That's crazy, that's amazing. And I, and I really got caught up in his enthusiasm. Unfortunately, in his enthusiasm, he wasn't really giving hard dates, but he said generally that, you know, this lock was from 4,000 years ago, what he was looking at on this wall. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people for the next 200 years that took him really literally. And so everybody's been saying this 4,000-year-old Egyptian lock. This is what we've been thinking for about 200 years. So 
I got a hold of the people at the Digital Karnak Project, um, who are out of California, and they are creating beautiful reconstructions of Karnak online and trying to make digital renderings of it, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, this is what he said. This is, these were his observations. Unfortunately, also in his observations, he mentions the fact that he, it was so hot that they could not rest. They could not stop for him to actually draw. He was only able to observe and then and keep moving on. <clears throat> he mentioned two other things that he saw. Uh, he mentioned the temple gates. He mentioned the lock on the temple gates. And he mentioned a man making an offering of two obelisks. So the folks at Digital Karnak said, we don't know what he was looking at. It's been another 200 years, and he didn't draw it. And things continue to get ruined when we're talking about ruins. So we don't know exactly what he was looking at, but we're pretty sure we know the wall, because we have the offering of the two obelisks. And this is enormous and well-known, and people know exactly where it is, and it's at Karnak. This is the Palace of Mott. Palace of Mott was built in the 15th century BCE, which means that what he was looking at was actually a 3,200-year-old representation of the Egyptian lock. And I know that that seems like I'm probably splitting hairs, because 800 years, and we're talking about millennia, not a big deal. But the reason that I care about this is because of this. This is cuneiform. This is the cuneiform word for lock master. This isn't hieroglyphics. This isn't Egyptian, this is Mesopotamian. And also will likely get tattooed on me sometime in the near future, because that's awesome, right? <laughs> and even if it actually says something terrible, like butt master, it's, you know, <laughs> there are probably like two people in the world that could actually translate it, so I'm not worried. So, what's exciting about this, Rob Sakate, Rob Sakate. Uh, so there's a guy named Daniel Potts. He was an archaeologist. Um, Presently in uh, Australia, has traveled all over the world, run institutes. Um, in the late 80s, there was an interesting uptick in the study of physical security in Mesopotamia. And most people were saying, most of his contemporaries were saying there were no complex locking mechanisms, it was all latches and bolts, and that was it. However, they kept coming across this constellation of terms that didn't fully make sense with what they were using as their mechanical models for the locking mechanisms. So Daniel Potts comes along and says, well, you know, we know that the pin lock existed generally in this vague timeline in other nearby parts of the world. What if we use that as the mechanical model for this constellation of words that we are not able to define? Doing this, he was then able to dig into tomes of cuneiform and actually pull out and better define and, and, and uh, uh, build out this language a little bit more using some of the, this constellation of words now properly defined as parts of the mechanical lock. <laughs> of course, this is all supposition. This is 1990. And he's saying, you know, say suppose this is what it happens to be. And it was good work, interesting linguistic work. But I dropped him a line recently, and I said, has anybody confirmed this? Has anybody come through on your work and, and codified it? Have there been archaeological discoveries that can back it up? And he sent me an article by Karen Radner. And Karen Radner is the one that took the word lockmaster and said, this is what it means wrote a paper defining the word lockmaster and talking about this role in the courts of uh, Neo-Assyria. And I read this paper and I was incredibly excited, incredibly excited. Because more important than her defining the word lockmaster, which again was very cool, and I actually wrote to her asking for the, cune the cuneiform so that I could eventually get it tattooed on me and she obliged, she was very nice. Um, she draws a really important connection between two technologies. This is an Assyrian door seal. The Assyrians were huge into seals. Any of you that have studied um, like crypto or uh, uh, security seals, any of that stuff that's coming up a lot right now, will probably have come across the uh, Assyrian penchant for seals. People would actually wear their seals around their neck, their personal seals. Um, they're big into the, this as a concept. And this was their door seal. This is what they would put over a door. There would be a peg running through a bolt. <coughs> Remove the peg and you can open the bolt, easy as that. It wasn't hard security, but then they would put a seal around that peg and then seal clay over the peg. In order to remove the peg, you know, had to break the seal. And they were intricate like this, so they weren't going to be readily recreated. So it wasn't high security, but at least you knew when somebody had trespassed. And that was one of the original uses for locks. It's one of the current uses for locks as seals. I mean, one of the most secure locks in the world. You could punch off of a safe that it's put onto, but there's no way to open it without them knowing that it's been opened. So, that peg in the middle of the door seal was a sikatu. That was the word for that peg. 
Sicate is the plural of sicatu. What she was saying was, the plural of the word for peg is the same word that we are using for the pins in the mechanical lock. The central component of the door seal is the same linguistic word, the evolution for the central component in the mechanical system. So now we have a linguistic evolution from one technology to the next, something we had never been able to put together looking at it from Egyptian origins. We have no precursor in the Egyptian train of thought with this. And I dropped her a line asking, you know, partially for the tattoo, but mostly because I wanted to know if I could then say that this linguistic evolution could be interpreted as a mechanical evolution, if this is where it started, if this is where mechanical security started, if this was the moment. She told me that the last archaeological door seals that they have found in those areas date back to around 2500 BCE, and that the linguistic, that constellation of terms that is now understood to be a mechanical lock began to emerge around 1800 BC. And that's 500 years before the, the wall at, at, uh, at the Palace of Mach. So somewhere in this 700 year period, the death of the door seal and the birth of the lock. And none of you care about that as much as I do. <laughs> but I cannot tell you how much I care about that. I can't tell you how exciting it is to me. I, I also can't tell you how exciting it is to me to write to an archaeologist that runs an institution and has a 37-page CV that I had to find on the internet to find his email address, and he writes me back in an hour, excited about what I want to do with this research. It's thrilling. It's stuff that I've never been able to deal with before. <coughs> so. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that it wasn't the 3,200-year-old Egyptian lock? Why does it matter that I want to know the origin? It's because I want to know why this evolved. I want to know why it was created. I want to know why every culture that has come up adopts locks independently of every other culture, or as an evolution from one culture to the next, why locks continue to stay around, how they've changed, and what they were used for originally. One of the biggest things is that locks locked up communal or state property originally. It wasn't something you would have on your door, typically. It was, a, it was, it was for a, you know, the, the, the granary or, or, or whatever else. That would have a lock on it. And the people that actually had the keys for that, for them it was a symbol of power and prominence. The concept of the key to the city as an honorarium dates back to forever. There are biblical references to people walking around with keys slung over their shoulders to show off how important they were. Athena explicitly had the key to Athens. She was the god that the city was named after, and they still put a key in her hand to prove to her that she had dominion over it. So power and prominence from the birth of the lock, those tokens, the keys, have been important in that regard. Additionally, the way that we use locks now for the most part, we lock our door and we walk out and we trust that everything's fine, that is not the origin of locks. In the origin of locks, it was the first form of two-factor authentication. Let me tell you about those lock masters. You know why the lock masters be became uh, part of the court in Neo-Assyria? And those of you that know Assyrian lore by, or uh, history, by the way, will know that Neo-Assyria is actually around the Roman era. And that was one of the things I was worried about when I talked to uh, Karen Radner. But she said, no, 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 that's when this position started, but the language started back in the 1800s. Just in case anybody's checking me on my Assyrian history, I wasn't too worried. Uh, so, <laughs> the Rab Sakate, the lock masters, the reason that this position was created in the neo Syrian court was because people kept getting killed. There was an assassination that led to the, the new regime, and then that guy was almost assassinated and run out, and both of them in their bedchambers. More and more, the Assyrian kings were, were pulling back further and further into their own bedchambers. The entire empire was actually starting to, to come apart and, and get much closer and closer. So the last major Assyrian king of the Neo-Assyrian era, who ended up reconquering large swaths of the uh, Assyrian domain for them and was, by all accounts, the, the last important leader of those people, he created the lock masters because he was sick of people getting killed in their beds. He had guards. He had plenty of people to monitor the flow of, of human beings. But the lock masters actually controlled the pegs, the pins, from the lock themselves. They would carry them around. And when a door needed to be locked, they'd insert the pins, they'd take the key, and they would walk out of it. And so now people 
can control the guy that lets people in. They can control the guards. They can kill them. They can bribe them. They can do whatever else they want. But the lock master is somewhere else. There is no key to that lock. It was the first form of two-factor authentication. It wasn't meant to stand on its own. <coughs> and then everything sucked for most of the rest of human history. Um, that's not entirely true. It's not entirely true. There, there are enormous exceptions, in particular China, um, in their work in combination locks. Iran had some beautiful ideas in, uh, in how they implemented warded locks with beautiful screw-like mechanisms. Um, there was artistry everywhere. Locks are just gorgeous from this period of time when the technology sucked. But in this time, you know what there weren't much of? Lockless cultures. You'll find very few lockless cultures. And because locks are inherently a part of culture, all of those lockless cultures are countercultural. You've got uh, uh, Matthias here, uh, Johann Matthias, who uh, ran the Anabaptist Revolution in the middle of the last millennium. Um, don't worry if you haven't heard of this guy. I hadn't either. Uh, but he forced everybody to remove the locks from their doors in the town that he took over in Germany. And then he even had them remove all of their doors because he wanted every dwelling to be communal property. No locks anywhere there. And then they were eventually crushed and everybody got their doors back. <laughs> you have gypsies and travelers. The Romani tradition in many nations are generally lockless, tiny, movable societies. And they're very close, they're very familial. Everybody wanders in and out. You have the current Occupy movement. Most of those encampments were lockless encampments where people were free to move through spaces and would give each other privacy based on social contracts. And that now is actually exactly what a lock is. A lock is a social contract. The way that we use locks now, locking something and walking out of our house leaving it alone, not relying on that guard to not get killed as well as the lock. It's because we all decided to live in a society together and that lock is a symbol of the law, it's a symbol of the taboos, it's a symbol of personal and private spaces. That is what a lock is. A lock is a social construct more than it is a mechanical construct. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, this is Worms in Germany. This is the city seal of Worms in Germany. Yes? Why is the lock that construct and not the closed door? Uh, we, uh, I'll tell you about that later. Good yeah. Um, mostly tradition is the answer. Mostly tradition. Um, so, this is the uh, city seal of Worms in Germany. Worms is a, uh, uh, has a neat backstory to it. The key is there because of their locksmith king. Not anymore, but back in the day, there was a widowed queen who had done wonderful things for prosperous worms until one day, a monstrous lindworm, a dragon, appeared at the gate and said, feed me someone every day or I'm going to come in and kill all of you. <coughs> so they start feeding him and they do a lottery and people keep getting picked and thrown to the dragon and it eats them and everything sucks. And then the queen's name gets drawn because she was, you know, one of the people, she put her name in, her name gets drawn and she was about to get thrown into the dragon when a locksmith ran up and said, hold everything. I've built a suit of razor armor. Feed me to the dragon. So this locksmith, for some reason, builds a suit of razor armor and they feed him to the dragon and it rips the dragon up and he comes walking back in and makes the lock on the gate of the town and they put it in the seal. The queen marries him, he becomes the locksmith king. He's fantastic. There are a lot of stories about locks and locksmiths in myth and fable, um, all over Europe in particular. That just happens to be my favorite. The door locks of the people of Bamani in Mali really transcend all of the you know, interesting stories about the honor of locksmiths or the, 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 the you know, religious uh, associations that we had in Iran. There are people in Iran that would pierce their bodies with padlocks to show their direct physical connection to their God. In Mali, simultaneously religious icons, utilitarian objects and works of art, their mechanical strength matters less 
than their magical powers, and their social commentaries are communicated through symbols rather than words. Locks extol marriage, promote fertility, symbolize the gods, and direct social conduct. The lessons they teach speak of the creation of the universe, the value of balance, order, and harmony, and the need for sanity, st uh, for stability and equilibrium in the world. I think that it is hard to read this passage from the door locks of the Bamana of Mali without getting a little emotional about locks. So maybe you guys are starting to care a little bit as much as I do. A wife and a husband would be given a lock for their hut when they got married, and that would separate them from the rest of the community. That was their space. It would be carved for them by the community and given to them. They aren't secure. Anybody could walk in and literally rip it off the door without a problem. But they were symbols. They were symbols. And in the symbology, it really did tell the story of the world. This was their origin story on the door of every home to separate new families from the communal family of their tribe. In the Andes, there's a fantastic little folk song. My parents lock me, my parents lock me, the lock of the child of Runa. It just can't be destroyed, it just can't be broken into pieces. With my heart of hope and love, I break the chain into pieces and I destroy the lock. My parents see me, my parents see me. With my heart of hope and love, I destroy the lock. For any of you that have ever picked a lock, again, these cultural folk songs have to make you feel a little something for the locks. And in Iran, back to Iran, we've been talking a lot about Iran. <coughs> There's a gorgeous tradition when a woman is pregnant. They tie a small rope around her stomach as the child is growing. They bless a lock and they secure that lock onto the rope. It bonds the child to life itself. It keeps the child and the mother connected. That is what it symbolizes. It's removed as the child uh, is born. And there's more, the, 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 the body piercing tradition. The locks in Iran are beautiful well beyond their intricate ironwork. Security, however, was not the only reason why Iranians made and bought locks. Spiritual and psychological needs which the inherent symbolism of the lock helped to fulfill were also important considerations. However, it will not be long before in Iran, as in the West today, it will be devoid of all but its purely utilitarian aspect. That sucks. It sucks that, I was gonna say we, but all of you <laughs> walk around in your lives every day seeing one of the most ubiquitous things in the world and you don't realize that those Two cubic inches of brass contain the story of how all of us have learned to live together in an ever smaller world. That's what a lock is. There is still some symbolism left, though. There is still some beauty and some love left. This is a tree in Russia. And some of you may have heard of this tradition where you and your lover carve your names into a lock and lock it into some public and permanent installation to symbolize the permanence and publicness of your own love. It's a beautiful tradition. You'll find it all over the place. But for the most part, we do only look at the utilitarian aspects. But the utilitarian aspects are socially powerful as well. And there was an incredible period of time when those pure utilitarian mechanical aspects changed the world. And it wasn't that long ago. <coughs> this is a warded lock. And the idea behind a warded lock is very simple. This pattern cut into the key, all those beautiful ornate Victorian keys that you've probably seen, that pattern is recreated in plates inside the lock. All the key is doing is avoiding those plates and then hitting a, a latch. That's it. Very simple. The lever lock was created as a direct response to an attack on the warded lock. Warded locks could be easily impressioned. That is, you could easily make a key by simply observing the lock itself. In fact, let's step back. If I were to take a solid rectangle of metal instead of a key and put a small sheet of wax on it. When I insert it into the lock and begin to turn, I'm going to see these markings on the wax right away. I pull it out, I cut that out of the wax and the metal. I put it back in, recoat it with wax, turn, and now I'm going to get these pegs here. 
I'm going to carve that out, turn, and now I finally get this guy, and the lock works, and I have a key that will always work in that lock. It's called the wax pad attack. It was one of the earliest concepts in impressioning. So the lever lock, the whole idea was that when you would turn your key, it would actually lift something on a pivot, on a pivot. So you couldn't get that impression in the wax. First lever lock was incredibly insecure. It was a single lever, just had to be lifted up to the right height and pulled back, and that was it. <coughs> so, around the time that the lever lock was being created, in the 1770s, there's also this guy Brahma. The lever lock, by the way, can absolutely be impressioned. Uh, you just use a different method. But it was, it was the start of this really cool mechanical revolution in England. Now, Brahma happened to be attending when this guy, Baron, who is thought of today as the inventor of the lever lock, um, Brahma was attending, and he, and he saw this lever lock, and he had been thinking about locks himself for quite a while. Now, why didn't he take his ideas about the lever lock and make what would eventually turn out by a guy named Chubb to be a fantastic and, and still sold today high security lever lock? Well, it's because he had a much crazier lock in mind. <coughs> this is the Brahma safety lock. Um, this is a vault version of the safety lock. Now, what's going on here is that each of these cuts along the outside are of slightly different heights, and they're going to push a couple of sliders down, and when all of the sliders have a gate lined up at the right height, the whole thing can rotate. It's actually a pretty simple idea, but really clever, and advanced the art of lock making by, I, I mean, it hadn't advanced in 1,500 years, maybe more, and he just brought it into the future. This is still sold today, still crazy hard to pick, still super expensive, still used in high security applications. When he created it, there was also this funny little lock meme that was going around. Uh, this is Louis, the 16th, and Louis was an avid locksmith as well. Louis loved locks and he was trained by the master locksmith Gamain in Versailles. He and Gamain made a particular lock together called the Armoire de Fer. Now the Armoire de Fer, made with Gamain, Louis thought was his, you know, prized and highest security invention. But they were just making warded locks. And the problem with warded locks is that as soon as you understand how it works, you don't need a key, you don't need anything, you can pick it open really, really easily. So, when Louis made a safe, uh, he inserted a bunch of secret documents in it and then lost his head. Because Gamain, it turned out, was a Jacobite, a revolutionary. And Gamain told the Revolutionary Council how the lock worked. He didn't go with them. He didn't have to open it for them. He just told them how it worked. They went, opened it up, found a bunch of treasonous documents, and <laughs> there were all sorts of other reasons. He would have lost his head no matter what, probably. But that definitely contributed. <laughs> <clears throat> so Brahma in England is coming out with this lock. And he says, I can hand you this lock, even though I made it. And I know exactly how it works. I can't open it. <laughs> I can give you, and you, and you, and all of you, your own locks, and you won't, no matter what you do to your own lock, be able to open each other's. And he was so confident in that, that when all of a sudden, oh, uh, sorry, there was chaos, he made a lock, and everything was great. That was that slide. <laughs> all of a sudden, a lock picker appears. <clears throat> this lock picker is able to open his lock. Uh, and as a matter of fact, starts taking out advertisements. And then more people seeing these advertisements in the paper of a guy saying, hey, if you lost your Brahma key, I'll totally open it for you. <laughs> uh, started saying things like, yeah, he's just opening it with like a hat pin. It, you know, it's a terrible lock. Everything's the worst. And this is what was going on. This is one of the sliders from the original Brahma lock. When you push down on it, you can feel, if you're turning it, where that is catching. <clears throat> this was the improvement. They put in a series of serrations. A guy named Russell at the company put in these serrations, they bring it back to the locksmith, back to anybody, and nobody can open it anymore because they're getting caught up. They can't discern where the true gate is. They were so confident, as a matter of fact, that they made a lock that reads, the artist who can make an instrument that will pick or open this lock shall receive 200 guineas the moment it is produced. And they put it up in their store in Piccadilly. <clears throat> this is the important part. This might be the most important thing that Brahma contributed to security today. He made an amazing lock that was probably 100 years ahead of its time, and he advanced the art. But by making a public demand for the exploration of this security, he created an incredible environment. Unfortunately, because he was so good, and as I said, probably 100 years ahead of his time, 
He also created four generations of people who believed in the idea of perfect security. For the first time in human history, people began to believe that a lock by itself, alone, could be perfect and unopenable. They thought that the security arms race had stopped. In 1851, 70 some odd years after this lock had been invented, A.C. Hobbs rolls into England and picks the Brahma lock, picks the Chubb, that beautiful lever lock I mentioned before, picks all their locks. <coughs> now, before the Great Exhibition started, Americans weren't viewed very highly over there. This is just some copy from uh, an observation of our exhibit before it opened. Even their ingenuity, great as it is, becomes ridiculous when it attempts competition with Europe. Double pianos, a combination of a piano and a violin, a chair with a cigar case in its back, and other mongrel constructions belong to a people that would be centaurs and mermen if they could. To which I say, of course we would, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be a centaur in a heartbeat. Okay, save on gas. <laughs> so, um, America then rolled in and did amazing things in agriculture. Part of another talk. They did amazing things with yachts. You know the America's Cup? It's not called the America's Cup because it started in either of the continents of the Americas. It's called the America's Cup because a ship named the America rolled in and beat 51 British yachts by seven miles on a 53-mile course. And the queen flipped out and said, who won? And they said, America. And she said, who was second? And they said, no one. <laughs> <coughs> Still true. Um, <laughs> Okay, but A.C. Hobbs comes in and he picks their locks. So throughout the exhibition, throughout the exhibition, the opinion of America in the press had been growing and growing and growing. With agriculture, they said, you know what? Good on them. A nation with a continent in its pocket better know how to farm. And they bought all of our plows and they bought all of our reaping machines. They bought our guns for their military. And the yachts. The yachts appealed to a very different part of their culture. It wasn't just look at those farmers farming, good for them. It was look at these engineers, look at these artisans. Those st are stern daguerreotypes that they disliked, even started to win some awards and some sculpture as well. And in general, they were saying, look at these Americans giving us more, because that's what world fairs were about back then, was collecting the best technology and art of the world to your country. Look at these Americans giving us more than any other nation. This was sea change for how we were perceived by the European world. But when Hobbes opened that lock, he was there shilling his own lock, by the way, which got opened about four or five years later, I think. When Hobbes opened that lock, the tone was very different. We believed before the exhibition opened that we had the best locks in the world, and among us, Brahma and Chubb were reckoned quite as impregnable as Gibraltar. Even more so, for the key of the Mediterranean was taken by us some years ago. It seems cruel at this time of day when men have been made to look on their bunches of keys with something of a sense of security to throw that feeling to the winds. It's heartbreaking, and they're beautiful writers back then. It was the nail in the coffin of the British sense of self-esteem at that moment in time. <laughs> it was saying that four generations of people were wrong about the idea of perfect security. But they didn't hold on to that at first. As a matter of fact, that same article that said how cruel it was to scatter the British sense of security to the winds said, you Brits get over there and pick his lock. <coughs> they didn't. <clears throat> not for several more years. And then in the years that followed, they kept working and kept working. There were more competitions, more people picking locks, taking out ads in the paper, opinion pieces. The great lock controversy rolled on for a decade. Now at the outset, this is Punch Magazine, sort of like the onion of its day, but with more cultural stuff as well. As lock picking is now being cultivated as a science, we begin to fear that the police may hesitate to interfere when they see an individual engaged in an ingenious operation on a street door. <clears throat> they wrote this whole and very funny tongue-in-cheek piece about how all of the lock artists are coming into town 
and then they named Brahma and Chubb and, and Hobbes, of course, but then they also <laughs> named a bunch of well-known thieves. Um, they were just joking about the fact that this, you know, what they normally think of as a criminal act was starting to be seen by such vaunted people and being talked about in the Royal Society and, and these mechanical institutes. But it was very fun and a, and a fair piece. <coughs> a decade later, after this has rolled on for a year, and after perfect security has been proven dead because a decade had gone on, for 10 years, sorry, not a year, because perfect security had not been reproven in a decade. Does not a certain compunction of taste suggest that the operations needful for such a purpose, studying locks, had better, like those of anatomy, for instance, be performed, if not in private, yet at least without very ostentatious publicity? This was at the end of a very vitriolic piece talking about the fact that they were just sick of it. Just sick of it. Sick of seeing the locks that they were buying from people tested in public. Sick of seeing the locks that they were buying from people published in papers about how they were open in the most recent competition. Thank you. And that feeling, that feeling of punch and of British society in general being sick of it, completely overwhelmed the enthusiasm of those researchers that continued studying and picking and so on and so forth. <coughs> For the next 40 years, we see an incredible uptick in ignorance in the popular press in England. There are articles showing drawings of Hobbes' tools that he used to pick their lever locks. There are descriptions of exactly what they did to open different locks. There are opinion pieces, letters to the editor, advertisements taken out in all of the popular newspapers for a decade talking about how they're opening each other's locks and can't open mine and that wasn't fair, bro, and so on and so forth. Less bros, they really were beautiful writers. <laughs> but by about 1900, after 40 years of being sick of it, after 40 years of never being able to return to those eight generations of a belief in perfect security, people decided that it was enough. That the lock on their door, no matter the technology behind it, just had to be enough. And today, the way that we use locks are as that social contract. And if you pick a lock, you're trespassing against society. And that can be very exciting. <laughs> but the whole idea of a lock today is not some complex mechanical thing. As a matter of fact, if you do come over and pick locks with me, you will be able to understand every single lock on that table. You'll be able to understand every single attack that I'm going to teach you. You'll be able to understand it all very quickly, and everything after that is practice. The class that I ran yesterday, there was a lot of talk about the ways in which we approach, the vulnerability assessment, the different technologies and how we interpret them. But every time I said, does everybody understand that? Everyone was like, yeah, of course. And then we practiced, and you practice, and you practice, and that's all it is at that point. It's just tactile feedback. It's just some basic mechanical skills. The genius comes in the people that can hold it all together in their head before it becomes brass, and then make the brass, you know? That's where the genius of this is. And all of the rest of us, are just relying on each other not to walk through each other's doors. That's what a lock is. That's what physical security is today. Now, I said that uh, these guys would come back later. Yale and town. And I don't really have much more to say on, on this entire topic, but Yale and town, what I love about them is two things. Number one, Yale, back in America working in his lock shop, not dealing with the lock controversy, actually really coming on the scene in the middle of it. Didn't go to England, didn't contribute to any of that, but in his workshop, that paratoptic lock that I fled, that I slipped past real quick earlier, the one that Hobbes was in England shilling, he picked that, just playing around one day. And I'm sure there was a moment of him being like, ah, you know, picking, picking the, the current king. But right after that, there was a moment where he said, I can open any lock I've ever made, now that I can open this. Any lock that takes a key can and will be picked.
There are two locks on the market right now that have yet to be picked. One of them has been on the market for quite a long time. I don't think that for very much longer it will be two. I think that it will be one, and I think that sometime after that it will be none, unless somebody comes along with something really interesting. Locks can be picked if they have a key. That turned him to combination locks, and he did some amazing work in that field, and time locks. And what Yale contributed after that moment was not just interesting security in a new vein that, that led the, the American art, but it was also the knowledge and the very forthright assertion to anybody that wanted to hear it that your lock can be picked, and that is not what is keeping you secure. Town, I didn't realize I had him up already, sorry, Town was the last major American lock manufacturer. Yale died three months into their business partnership. Yale died Christmas of 68 uh, maybe, um, somewhere in there. And Town had to carry it on. Town, Town is probably the reason that everybody in the world uses pin tumbler locks. Because Yale had turned on to other things. Yale had turned on to the combination locks and other projects. But the pin tumbler lock Town championed it. And you know what else he championed? And I was a little disappointed to hear that. Thank you. I was a little disappointed to hear that when I first realized that it might be somebody that I was distantly related to that made pin tumbler locks the world standard. But what he also championed, I got some literature in the mail the other day, some antique literature from the Allentown Town Company when Town was still in charge. And right there in the pamphlet, the sales pamphlet, they, they give potential customers, it said, any lock can be picked, even ours. Imagine a company saying that today. No one would. No one would. But Town continued to beat that drum until the day that he died. And unfortunately, we've lost that tradition of people speaking forthrightly and publicly exploring the security in their lives. It's very disappointing. But I like these two guys a lot. I hope that you guys like them a little better now as well. <coughs> I usually put this slide at the end of every talk, but I don't really have any. I don't really have any additional rambling talks. There are wonderful people that have helped me out. The top three are the archaeologists that I reached out to and got back to me beautiful information. Barry Wells, Hanfe, and Eric Schmiedel were my first and finest teachers when I first learned how to pick locks, and they still support me to this day. Wonderful people from Tool in the Netherlands. Kevin Dunk provided that warded image. There are no good warded images on the internet. Most of them really suck, but I like what he did. It's a wonderful tutorial on lockpicking101.com, which was my first home when I first started learning about locks. AntiqueLocks.com is an amazing community if you want to learn more about the history of any of this stuff. They're absolutely incredible. It's a slow-moving community. It's a bunch of old dudes, but they are amazing, and their knowledge is incredible. Uh, and that last group of people are just a bunch of wonderful people that let me talk through all of this crap, even though I care about it a lot more than they do, and help me bounce these ideas off of them. I was telling somebody at dinner last night that when I was 17, I worked in a hospital, and I at the age of 17, was put in charge of my community's dead, and I would get home being exhausted and feeling completely worn out physically and emotionally, and it was the best job I ever had. I had never in my life, after that point, felt like I was doing something worth doing at the end of the day. I did stuff that I enjoyed, I did stuff that I was good at, but I never did something that I felt was worth doing. But understanding why you lock out your doors understanding the sociological and anthropological implications of physical security, this is the first time since I was 17 that I feel like I'm doing something worth doing. And I hope that at the end of this, all of you care a little more about the lock than that first story. <laughs> Thank you all so much for the opportunity to tell you about my research. Are there any, I can answer your question now, and I can, and, and uh, anybody else. Um, why is the closed door not enough? Here's a quick thought experiment. Put yourself in front of, um, put yourself in front of an open door frame. The open door frame, you're in a public space. How difficult is it for you to walk through an open door frame with no door on? Probably not very. Your breathing probably doesn't change. You just treat it as an extension of your own personal space. Now, there's a, a door in front of you with no lock on it. How hesitant are you when you open that door, when you go to explore that next part of the space? Does it still feel attached to your personal space? Now, an open door, but that open door has a lock on it. Now, it's open, 
So maybe you think of it as an extension of that public space. But that lock clearly indicates that at some point in time, there are key holders. At some point in time, this is a private space. How confidently do you move through that? Do you look for somebody in that space to confirm that it's acceptable for you to be there? Or do you just move through boldly? Now in front of you is a locked door, but you will go through it. How did you know it was locked? Did you try the handle? Would you just try the handle of any door you came across? And it's locked. You're going to open it. What does it feel like in that moment that you begin manipulating the pins or when you go to kick it in or however you get through by wit or by force? What does that feel like? Has your breathing changed now? A lock tokenizes our social obligation to one another. A door is a piece of architecture. I think that's the best answer I can give you. Not a problem. Any other questions? Do I have time? No time. I'll be at the table. I'm putting some locks together right after this, so it might take a second, but I'll answer any questions I can. Again, thank you all so much. Thank you.